Okay, this is our third video of the Dear Moody series and the video is on policy. It's specifically on the Renewable Energy White Paper from 2003. Last time we dealt with the Energy White Paper of 1998 where ESCOM said that they were going to restructure. And they said that everybody should have access to energy and they said they wanted to level the playing fields. And so far, it's 21 years later, none of that has happened. So let's look at the policy, which is, informs our, the strategy, and then see where we go from there. I'm going to switch to the white paper now. This is the front page of the white paper, 59-page document. As you know, A1 is the section we're in. A is policy and law. 1 is policy. 102 gives me an order. Policy 2003 White Paper on Renewable Energy, which is here, 2003 White Paper on Renewable Energy. Let's zoom into that so we can get a bigger picture. And let's see what we see. Talking about the African Renaissance, talking about air pollution from fuelwood, mainly because of air pollution, fuelwood was used inside shacks and so on. I mean, Houses maybe didn't have that problem, and so they spoke about that here. It says, Government is committed to the introduction of greater levels of competition in electricity markets. Well, we know that from the 1998 white paper, from the 1995 document, we know that the new government intended for this to happen. There would be a diversification. There would be an introduction of competition and a leveling of the playing fields. At the moment, the law protects the monopoly. The South African Energy Policy, Energy Act, Electricity Law, it all protects the monopoly, ESCOM. It's never been changed in 25 years of democracy to level the playing fields. The government has made announcements over and over again of what they intend to do, but they haven't been able to do it. And yet, they've got the world's biggest and most expensive consultancies advising them. If one has to ask oneself, why are these honorable companies not able to change the minds of South Africans? Why is it left to this active citizen to make this happen? And I mean, such an important paper was signed by the Deputy Minister of Minerals and Energy. Where was the minister at the time? Table of contents, table of contents, glossary of terms, what does everything mean? Fancy tables. The production and distribution of energy should be sustainable and lead to an improvement in the standard of living of citizens. Sustainable with new coal power stations when we've known for 50 years how bad coal is, even since the 19th century. London and New York had something called pea soup fog. People used to receive supplies of coal into what was called the coal hole. So the basement of their three-story flats or house <clears throat> would have coal delivered, they would burn the coal, and on days when the wind wasn't blowing, there would be a smog hanging over their cities. We already knew this in the 19th century. With all of our technology in the 21st century, with robots and incredible technology, socially, have we progressed? The purpose of the policy. South Africa relies heavily on coal to meet its energy needs because it is well endowed with coal resources. True, we export a lot of this coal. However, at the same time, South Africa recognizes that the emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide from the use of fossil fuels such as coal and petroleum products has led to increasing concerns worldwide about global climate change. I know there's a big debate about global climate change I'm not going to get into now, but one thing is a fact Environmental destruction is happening at a rapid rate. With pollution, 
with plastic in the ocean, with landfills, with chopping down rainforests. We know that that's happening. So whether the science says that global climate change is caused by the sun, by humans, it doesn't matter. We know the weather's changing. We don't know why it's changing. But we do know environmental destruction is happening faster and faster. We're currently consuming three planets, and we only have one. And South Africa is well endowed with renewable energy resources. They can be sustainable alternatives to fossil fuels, and they remain largely untapped. The above-mentioned concerns about global climate change were articulated at the Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002. And South Africa made a commitment, and participant nations, participating nations made a commitment to what was become known as the Johannesburg Declaration. And this white paper is in 2003, the year after South Africa made the declaration that it was going to change. There's going to be energy security, there's going to be cheaper electricity. To get started, we're going to set a target of 10,000 gigawatt hours of renewable energy consumption to be produced by biogas, wind, solar and small-scale hydro by 2013. This didn't happen. It's 2019, it still hasn't happened. I've been trying to get statistics from the government about how much renewable energy is contributing and as far as I can tell it's not happening. What about subsidies? Big power stations get massive subsidies from government. Look what's going on at the moment. ESCOM has received 420 billion rand from the government as a loan. Is it a loan? Is it a subsidy? Will it ever be paid back? Why didn't renewable energy get subsidies? Do we have an enabling environment? Government must create an enabling environment through the introduction of fiscal and financial support mechanisms. And there must be an appropriate legal and regulatory framework to allow renewable energy technologies to compete with fossil-based technologies. Barriers to entry must be reduced. The White Paper on Energy Policy. This paper encourages the entry of multiple players into generate. So now I read this. It's 2003. And I come along and I say, great, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to invest. And hundreds or perhaps thousands of local South African entrepreneurs have gone out of business because they didn't understand something called greenwashing. And I didn't invent the term. Dr. Hermann Scheer, who spent the whole of the 1980s talking to the German government about feed-in tariffs, a special tariff to pay to private people to make electricity, which started in 1991. Dr. Hermann Scheer says in his book, The Solar Economy, he talks about greenwashing. He says governments make statements and create policy that they have no intention of implementing to send false signals to the market because they want to achieve other goals. I'm not making this up. I'm not inventing it. I'm not hallucinating. I'm telling you that the world's top expert on renewable energy says this in his book. If you don't believe me, you can actually download a PDF of the book today. It's called The Solar Economy. It's by the late Dr. Herman Scheer. I met him at a conference in Las Vegas in 2009, we had a morning together, about six or seven of us in a room. It was fantastic. And I said, how did you get feed in tariffs working in 1991? And he said, David, it's because we spent the whole of the 1980s working with government. And this paper from 2003, between 2003 and 2008, our government spent six years, hard years, hard work, with SHARP, we're going to look at the SHARP document later on, creating the environment for feed-in tariffs, the legislative framework. I started my energy journey in 2003, and in 2004, for my 40th birthday, I had breakfast with my friends, and I called it a group of 12 friends we met. It was called Our Energy Group. <clears throat> I was already reading all this stuff.
long time ago. This white paper on renewable energy supplements government's overarching policy on energy as set out in his white paper on energy of 1998, which we spoke about in the last video. The need and urgency for white paper on renewable energy has, base, has its basis in the World Summit on Sustainable Development, Johannesburg Plan of Action from 2002, which says, Diversify energy supply by developing advanced, cleaner, more efficient, affordable and cost-effective energy technologies, including fossil fuel technologies and renewable energy technologies. With a sense of urgency, substantially increase the global share of renewable energy resources with the objective of increasing its contribution in total energy supply, recognizing the role of national and voluntary regional targets. This white paper sets out the government's vision, policy principles, strategic goals, we know that policy strategy, and objectives for promoting and implementing renewable energy in South Africa. This policy will inform the public and international communities of the government's goals, how the government intends to achieve them, and inform the government agencies and organ of state, organs of state of these goals and their roles in achieving them. Let's highlight this whole page. And there's a vision, definition of renewable energy, all kinds of stuff. The purpose of the white paper is set out is to set out government's principles, goals, and objectives for renewable energy. It furthermore commits government to a number of enabling ac actions to ensure that renewable energy becomes a significant part of its energy portfolio over the next 10 years. This is 2003. By 2013, six years ago, renewable energy was going to become a significant part of the government's energy portfolio. And as you can see, they don't talk about ESCOM's energy portfolio. They talk about the government's energy portfolio because the ESCOM is a monopoly with one shareholder, the government, and the government's shareholder are the voters who put them there. If ESCOM is at fault, it's the voters' fault. And then there's a whole lot of stuff here. I'm just going to look. Okay, and we get to this very, very, very important document. on page 18 or 59 of this white paper. Over here, this over here is called the ESCOM cliff. It shows it as starting in 2025, but actually it's starting already. Because the new power stations are not generating. Majuba was faulty from the beginning. It's on a faulty coal field. Coal is trucked in from far away. And then you sh it shows you all the different power stations and how the energy cliff suddenly starts in 2025. You can see this line here, this purple line going up. You can also see that from about 1980, from about 1975, South Africa started building new power stations, which took five years. And they came online in the early 1980s. And there was this huge spare capacity here, which the government sold. And then more power stations came online with more spare capacity. Let's just make this bigger. You can see du Duva came online. Tatuka came online. Matimba came online. Natabo came online. Kendall came online. And then later Majuba. But all of these power stations in this period Kubu came online. Nuclear power station. And so there was a peak, and ESCOM and the, the experts said that we'll run out of electricity in 2008, which is over here, which we did run out of electricity. We had load shedding. We actually had already had load shedding over here. Because when you build a big power station, you bring a lot of energy onto the grid very quickly, and you have excess power. And then you sell this excess power for 20 years to your big customers and you run out in 1995 and there have been complaints that big customers are getting electricity cheaply and those contracts should have run out 20 years ago
There's another problem. In 2010, over here, ESCOM agreed to reduce its pollution from its really poor quality coal, its chimneys, flue gases, flue gas desulfonization. And this process started in 1974. From 1974 to 2010, ESCOM knew that they would have to reduce the impact that their power stations have on Mother Earth. And they signed with NERSA, the National Energy Regulator, that by 2015 they would meet those requirements, and by 2015 they didn't meet the requirements, and now they need to meet them by 2020. And if they don't meet them, they have to switch off a third of their power stations. And whilst this shows that we should have 48 gigawatts by now, extrapolate that line, if, if, if Madupi and Kusile were online, as we expect them to be now, we'd be at about 48 gigawatts, we sometimes only have 28 gigawatts, we sometimes only here. And if we switch off a third of that, we'll be at 20 gigawatts, we'll be over here. And all of this will be gone. And we'll have load shedding every single day. ESCOM already don't meet their license conditions in terms of 2010 legislation. And if NERSA allow ESCOM to continue to operate after 2020, which they probably will, then ESCOM becomes, then NERSA becomes redundant. NERSA becomes a white elephant, a rubber stamping authority. We have to be worried and concerned and be doing something about this cliff which we've known about for 40 years and which we would put into the 2003 White Paper on Energy. So this became visible in 2003. And five years later, as predicted, load shedding started. <clears throat> let's go back to full page size. And let's see what we see. There's a constitution, the Bill of Rights. Everybody has the right. Energy should be available and affordable. What's not available and is not affordable. My personal opinion and belief is that South Africa has 28 gigawatts and should have 280 gigawatts. We have 10% of what we need. How do I work that out? It's not difficult. Consider how much coal is exported. And you can work at how much electricity is made with the coal that we export. Consider how much iron ore is export. Consider how much coal and energy is needed to smelt that iron ore and produce all the downstream activities. And know this, that South Africa exports raw materials which get made in China and Australia and Germany and Israel and America into finished products. And we import finished products. And that's why our costs are so high in South Africa. And then we, we don't have an, an electric vehicle fleet in South Africa. But then our government charges 45% import duty for electric vehicles. And even a car, which is made in East London, a Mercedes, costs a third more in South Africa than it costs in America even though the car that's driving in America was made in South Africa. Does anybody understand that? A car that's made in South Africa costs a third more than a car that's made in America. The Bill of Rights says everybody has an environment to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. The environment must be protected. The state must respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights of the bird advice. But the state is not doing this. We almost ran out of water in the Western Cape last year. In 2018. If we ran out of water, we would have had a war zone as 4 million people fight for water. The government says they solved the problem, but actually private people put in masses of embedded water infrastructure. I continue to put more water. I put another 5,000 liters of tanks in in the last two months. Go to page 39. If we make more electricity, we have potential for industrial growth. We're going to set the target. We've seen it already. 10,000 gigawatt hours by 2013. We're going to create an enabling environment.
The current price doesn't include the cost of environmental externalities. And we know about health risks and we know about people dying from pollution. And we know that South Africa's maize belt is in the area corn. It's called corn. We call it maize. America calls it corn. America, South Africa's maize belt is in the coal fields where our big power stations are. And people are sick. Gluten intolerance is high in South Africa. I can't eat normal bread in South Africa. But in Europe, when I go there, I can eat bread no problem as much as I want. Germany's got a feed-in tariff. United Kingdom had renewables obligation certificates. South Africa introduced a feed-in tariff in 2008, and by 2010 they cancelled it and changed it to renew renewable obligation certificates, a tender system. And in that year, Britain changed from the ROC system to the feed-in tariff system because the feed-in tariff system works and the tender system doesn't work. And there's so much documentation on this. There's going to be wheeling, which means that I can sell electricity to my neighbor. There'll be open access to the grid. There'll be power purchase agreements. The grid is owned by everybody. If you fly from South Africa to England, you fly in air lanes. When you fly over Angola or any other country or France, the airline pays for search and rescue, pays for radar control, pays the local grid. When you go on a railway line in Europe, the railway line is owned by the country, but you've got Virgin Rail and so many other private rail operators using the rail. The telephone, the international telephone network is a public grid with infrastructure providers that put infrastructure in and then private people who use the infrastructure. ISPs for the internet. The people that we buy internet services from, internet services provider. And they are back they are using the backbone. This is about leveling the playing fields. The National Energy Regulator in 2003 has jurisdiction over the entire industry and regulates market access through licensing of all producers greater than 5 gigawatt hours per annum. Transmitters and resellers and distributors. All electricity tariffs have to be approved by the NER that also regulates quality of supply and mediates disputes and customer complaints. Well, nurses is not doing this. I met nurses lawyer in Joburg and they are not doing this. They're protecting NERSA. They're not actually doing what NERSA's core requirement is to regulate the quality of supply, to check that feeding tariffs don't go up 25 times in 20 years, to license producers. But licensing has got license requirements. If ESCOM don't meet their license requirements, they should be switched off. Go to page 57. The way forward. A strategy on renewables will be developed. This is the strategy. There will be a practical implementation plan. The implementation plan was brought out together with Sharp in 2008. I was in government, in parliament, in City of Cape Town, when this strategy was introduced, when the feed-in tariffs were announced. The sustainable development criteria, the economy, the environment and social priorities will continue to guide policy, will continue to guide strategy in a balanced way for the longer term. And then there's some references. We've now seen the 1998 white paper on energy and we've seen the 2003 white paper on renewable energy. We understand government made announcements and in 2019 has not implemented them. They've done some stuff, but they haven't decentralized. NERSA is not functional. In other words, it's not achieving its mission of protecting everybody. It's not making sure that ESCOM meet its license conditions.
Next time we're going to look at the Western Cape policy on sustainable energy. Thank you.